kind of, <clears throat> now what do we think about, I've heard a few that are fun, but I think one of the ones that we want to talk about is net disposable income. And I know James, you had a couple of thoughts on that. Yeah, this is one that caught my attention a few years ago. So PayPal was the, the kind of, you know, the pinup of companies that did this. And basically Dan Shorman um, said, he, he, there's, a, there's a great little, very short podcast on this and a couple of um, you know, articles about this. And essentially they looked down and they said, well, okay, we've been doing it, what everyone does, we benchmark our pay. And you work on the assumption, if you benchmark your pay, you're gonna pay people the correct amount, right? Um, but then they said, well, what if we compare the pay with a net disposable income calculation? It's fairly easy to get economic data on how much it costs to live in certain places based on you know, certain lifestyle assumptions. And they said, well, at the lower end of our organization, that benchmark pay that we've been adhering to that we thought was competitive actually meant that people couldn't make enough money to live, essentially, <laughs> and live and, and, and kind of exist <laughs> in, in the cities that were hiring them. So, so they said, okay, well, actually, we're going to introduce this as a metric, and we're going to say, well, that's the first barrier. It, does it result in a positive net disposable income for certain levels? Because we're going to use that to override what the market data tells us to pay people. And they did that in concert with a couple of other things, uh, providing additional financial education, the 401k matching and things. And, and they also, by the way, off the back of that, had the best financial year in history as well. So it certainly didn't, at least, you know, and it's not very statistic, but on the face of it, it didn't hinder them. Um, and the principle was, well, it's not, let's ignore any sort of social argument, social need argument for the company taking an interest in employee well being in that sense. But it was more like, well, if they're not happy, they're not comfortable, if they can't, they're constantly worrying about their personal finances or how they're going to send their kid to school or afford their rent the next month, then it's not going to be a good employee. <laughs> Even again, if you're very cynical about this, you're not going to get a happy, productive employee if they're, they're worrying about these things. Um, so I thought it was very interesting. I assume they're still doing it. I haven't heard that they're not. I'm just interested as to whether we've seen any other examples of that or any uh, opinions on that, the use of that metric. I don't know if I've seen people use that, you know, specifically and scientifically, but I think there's no question that some of the you know, some, you of, know, the some of the adjustment, adjustment and funding that happened in 2022 in particular was driven by cost of living. As much as we all love to sort of say it's not the cost of living, it's the cost of labor. It's the same concept, right? At the end of the day, you're talking about, you know, how do how should wages be scaled relative to what it takes to keep up, to live, to, you know, buy a house? You know, it, net disposable income is a specific way of measuring that. But I have no doubt in my mind that, you know, wage increases went up last year in part because inflation was up last year. It's a cost of you know, a cost of living argument to some extent. So I think people are sensitive to the topic of, and aware of the topic and, you know, responsive to employees that just don't want to fall behind. Um, but maybe not as, you know, scientifically as, as PayPal was. I think it's more, we have to be reasonable with the cost of labor just the same and, you know, not be responsible for changes in the cost of living, which is a very slippery slope to kind of go down um, if you're not careful. One of the terms that I heard not too long ago, and, and I think this comes up quite I hear this more and more frequently is, you know, a living wage. Um, you know, we talk about the, but I also heard one, I don't know if anyone else has heard of this, I heard this recently, it's recently, the thriving wage. Um, have you, what are thoughts on living wages? I and mean, is that a useful metric? I mean, it, to me, it, it seems like it's very much aligned to the idea behind, um, kind of James, what you're speaking of. Do we feel that that's an important metric for a comp team to consider? Uh, it is part of your EVP. You know, if, that, if that's what you're, you're promising to, to people that we're going to ensure that you enjoy your, your time with us, then yeah, I think it is. I think, I think it's very easy to assume that um, cost of labor is the only metric and ignore the fact that you are thereby inheriting the problems of other companies and accepting that as your primary driver for pay. Um, so I, I really like that term, thriving wage. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a fan of, I can think of a few companies that, that mentioned that term, but um, it, it, is, it is more work though. Like that's the thing, like it does take more work to sort of make sure you're delivering on that. And whenever I think of an EDP, I think it's like a social contract. And if part of that is what you're saying, we're gonna allow our employees to thrive. Well, you've got to make sure you're living up to your end of the bargain on that one, which does take a little bit more thought, I think. It does kind of factor into the, the emphasis on ESG as well. So if executives are going to be held accountable for any kind of ESG metrics, it feels like to me, living wage has to factor into that to some extent. So uh, to the extent your company is starting to report on that information or even holding uh, executives accountable as part of their performance for ESG, it seems like the compensation team would want to be pretty heavily involved in just understanding living wage or thriving wage uh, and being able to kind of factor that in. I think it's a useful exercise for any comp team just to kind of understand what's, so how does that compare to just the overall market practice? You know, if it's two completely different topics, uh, but they do intersect at some point. And so you want to kind of understand that as much as you do the really uh, structured sort of market data that you work with on a regular basis, I think. And I was, go ahead. Oh, I was, I was going to say, I agree with what's been said to provide somewhat of a, of a counterpoint though. I think it's also important to uh, make sure we're not, we're not trying to figure out how to fund someone's lifestyle, employees' lifestyle choices. You know, I mean, I think there's, there's a certain, um, 
balance there, right? I love the idea of considering and doing the analysis around living wage and thriving wage. I think those would be super insightful and helpful, but also understanding, you know, there's a certain point where uh, it's not necessarily the employer's responsibility to fund certain lifestyle choices and, and lifestyle wants uh, versus, you know, being competitive in the marketplace. So I think there's a multiple perspectives to consider on that topic.